And now it's my really great pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker, who is Timothy Silver. Uh, Dr. Silver is, or he tells me he was until just a few months ago, a uh, professor of history at App State. He, and, and he uh, is a professor emeritus. Uh, his teaching and research interests have been in environmental history of North America and with a focus on the Southern Appalachians, uh, uh, history of the national and state parks, and history of the ethnic groups in early America. Um, he is the author of a really great book that I know many of you know about, but if you don't, you'll, uh, well, you should. Sure, you should. You'll, you should read it. Um, it's a really good book about Mount Mitchell and the Black Mountains. And this has won a number of awards and it's been in several printings and so forth. And so the book has some lasting value and interest. Um, he is also the co author of, very, of a very recent book on the environmental history of the Civil War. And um, I should mention that uh, Dr. Silver will has brought some copies of both of those books, which are on a table over here, and uh, he can, he uh, can sell some of those and sign copies. And this morning he's going to talk to us about uh, Mount Mitchell, from Mount Mitchell to the Civil War, which concerns the intersection of Mother Nature and human nature in uh, writing and making history. So please welcome Dr. Timothy Silver. I'm gonna <clears throat> take off my mask so that <clears throat> hopefully you can, you can hear me. Are everyone here at the back okay? You good back there? Uh, my students always tell me that I don't need a microphone, that I can, you know, yell loud enough to, to um, uh, keep their attention. But I, I want to thank the, uh, the NC High Peaks uh, Trail Association for having me and for uh, Joe and uh, John and the other people that did so much work on this. And we've been going back and forth with emails and, and I know a lot of work has gone into it. And, um, you know, I, I really appreciate the chance to be here. And all of us, I think, who hike in the Black Mountains owe a huge debt of gratitude to this um, organization. If you've ever hiked, you know, the Crest Trail or Mount Mitchell Trail or, God help you, Colbert's Ridge, um, you, <laughs> you, you know how much uh, work they do on, on the trails and, and we all appreciate it. So it's a real honor um, for me to be here. And I'm going to talk mostly about Mount Mitchell since I'm in Burnsville, but I also want to talk a little bit, as, as Joe suggested, about what environmental history is and how we write environmental history and the kind of interplay between nature and human nature. And I should add that it's been um, uh, almost 20 years, 18 years since this book came out. And I, you know, continue to be uh, sort of amazed by the, the response that, that people have to it. Um, and I've also had a chance to get some perspective on it, I think, over that time and to kind of think about what I was really doing. You know, when you're close to a project, sometimes it's hard to, to know that. So that's what I want to do is reflect on this a little bit, talk about the, the writing some, and uh, then I'll, I'll get you to the Civil War. My dad uh, was a, a Baptist minister, and he used to say that uh, there were three rules for a, a perfect sermon to preach about sin, to preach about salvation, and to preach about 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I may go slightly over 15 minutes, but I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. So I'll try to, try to um, you know, be as, as succinct as possible. Um, when I started working on Mount Mitchell and I would tell friends and colleagues that I'm writing this book about the highest mountain in the east and they would say, well, how high is it? And I would say, well, 6684. And they're like, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, friends from the west aren't, aren't impressed by that. And if they asked me to show them a picture, 
I would always show this one, which is kind of a way to downplay the, the peak's importance. And they would look at it and they would go, you know, who, who cares about that? And I always try to explain that in the Appalachians, it's not so much elevation that matters, but it's relief. It's, it's how fast these things occur and that, you know, how fast you move from Piedmont uh, to mountains. And uh, that didn't cut much ice with them either. They still look at these things at 6,000 foot mountains. And, you know, in the South, they're not even above the tree line. Still got trees growing there, which uh, my New England uh, friends found uh, interesting. And so I kind of moved from that to talking about just Mount Mitchell and the people involved with Mount Mitchell as a really good story. And like all writers, and particularly those who, who write about the environment, I think there are several elements to a, a really good story. First of all, this interplay between nature and human nature, which is definitely um, part of the Mount Mitchell story. Memorable characters, also a part of the Mount Mitchell story. It has heroes, it has villains. Um, good, true stories. That's the historian's problem when we tell stories, they have to be true. We're not writers of historical fiction, at least not on purpose. Um, you know, we, we try to tell true stories and we can't make up things. Uh, and then local to global implications. You know, what does Mount Mitchell mean, the history of Mount Mitchell for um, other areas, or as some of my friends put it, who cares and why? So I'm gonna just kind of work through this nature is a very elusive term. It's a noun that acts like an adjective in that we talk about nature, but when you ask someone to define nature, they will start describing things, forests, waterfalls, whatever. It's a very elusive term, but whatever it means, the Black Mountains are a great place to find nature and to work up your own definition of it. They're a place of many moods. And if you've been outside as, as this group has, you know it's a, a place where you can really um, get to know the landscape. And I did try to get to know it. As I said, the book was written almost 20 years ago and these were the tools of my trade, a, a beat up four wheel drive pickup truck and some old boots and a field guide and a point and shoot camera. And so when I was out on, on these trails, you know, looking at Mount Mitchell and, and the Black Mountains, um, I suddenly discovered that the forests I was walking and hiking in were very different from the forests I read about in the field guides. For example, um, this is about the best picture I have of this. The field guides will tell you that walking from uh, the base of Mount Mitchell to the top, sort of like walking from you know, Georgia to Canada or something like that. And they lay out these forests and they say they're very well defined. You know, at the, at the base of the mountain, you find uh, what they call an Appalachian hardwood forest. And then you go a little bit farther up, you find a Northern hardwood forest. And then as you can see here, if you go right to the top of the mountain, you find the spruce fir forest, which is dark and, and black. And it's uh, the thing from which the mountains draw their name. But when I got out hiking, I, I discovered that uh, what I had on my hands was a much more random world <laughs> of, uh, of nature where vegetation was thick in some places, thin in others. It was uh, completely almost random and, and nonsensical. Chaos seemed to rule. I couldn't ever find these forest types, at least enough to identify them. And even worse, I think, the, the kind of nature described in the field guides lacks, uh, for want of a better term, a, a soul. There are no pileated woodpeckers, you know, screaming in the distance. No red squirrels barking from the trees. Uh, no bear tracks in the snow. And so also what I was after in writing Mount Mitchell was, again, for want of a better term, a kind of a soulful nature an experiential nature. I wanted people to, to know and, and sense what I was feeling. And so, as I said, I you know, got out and, and began to, to camp and hike at all seasons and tried to write that into the book. For the historian though, getting a grip on nature, the environmental historian anyway, is 
only part of what we do. So we've also got the much more difficult task of getting a grasp on human nature. And if you wanna start getting a grip on human nature in the Black Mountains, there's no better place to start than this poster from the uh, National Forest Service, which you might have, have seen. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this poster, again, I discovered that just about everything here was wrong. If you look at the, the Native American here, who I take to be a, a Cherokee warrior, that's not true at all. The first Native people to the area were um, members of the Pisgah culture, which predated the Cherokees. And the Pisgahs were a really advanced uh, kind of culture. They lived in stockaded uh, villages. They planted massive cornfields, changed the landscape with agriculture, fire, host of other things. And uh, instead of kind of this uh, Anglo looking pioneer uh, fellow here, I discovered that the first Europeans, the first white people, if you want to think of it that way, to see the Black Mountains were actually Spanish explorers, people like um, Hernando de Soto and Juan Pardo, who were, if, uh, if not dark skinned, at least uh, swarthy uh, in, in appearance. So one of the things we're about in doing environmental history is to kind of dispel a lot of the myths that plague certain areas. And so um, that was part of my effort here. The other thing I found um, very early on, there were people like this who, who settled in the blacks, but um, mostly what I found in the early history were real estate agents who were out, or real estate, no, I'm serious, who were out. There were these guys who went around and, and often from syndicates in Philadelphia or somewhere who would, go and kind of carve out all these large tracts of land and stake a claim to it. And then they would sell that off. There were a few people who got grants from the Revolutionary War and, and so forth, but um, mostly it was uh, uh, real estate people who were in the area early on. Now, the incident for which the Black Mountains are most famous also gives us some insights into human nature. And of course, I'm talking about the, the story of Elisha Mitchell, great story. University of North Carolina professor set out to measure mountains, trying to prove that uh, Mount Mitchell was higher than Mount Washington. That's a good story. What makes it an even better story is that he got into a dispute with a former student, a guy named uh, Thomas Klingman. And despite my best efforts to correct a historical record, I still find people who believe that Klingman and Mitchell were arguing over which mountain was highest. No, um, it was a far more typical academic dispute. They were arguing over who had been first to measure it and who deserved credit for, for measuring it. So it's a far more, far more, and if you've ever spent any time in academia, as, as Joe has, you know, he could tell you this is a, a pretty typical um, academic dispute. So it's a good story, you know. Um, what makes it a better story is that in 1857, Elisha Mitchell fell to his death in the Black Mountains while he was trying to resolve this controversy with Thomas Klingman. And he fell over this 40 foot waterfall, today known as, as Mitchell Falls. His watch, his pocket watch stopped at 81956, theoretically marking the exact time of his death um, in July of 1857. And uh, that too has, has made for you know, a good story. Even at the time, some people accused Thomas Klingman of murder. They said, you know, you lured Professor Mitchell into the wilderness with your, with your argument and then he fell. And you know, those kind of things that were going on. Um, <clears throat> to my mind, uh, one of the more interesting people in this, not Mitchell or Klingman, but uh, Big Tom Wilson, who according to his own account was the sole finder of Elisha Mitchell's body. Mitchell had been dead about 11 days when they, when they found him. And um, again, to, from Big Tom's retelling, it was Big Tom and Big Tom alone who found the, the body, although there were several search parties. A, a real character, a real Appalachian entrepreneur, he, uh, he traded on that reputation for finding Mitchell's body uh, the rest of his life, in fact. And he liked nothing better than to go to Asheville and have his picture made and and sit on Main Street and, and tell stories. And um, I always joke that if he were around today, he would probably be running a 
string of tanning booths and CBD shops and, uh, and, and probably be doing taxidermy on the side or something, you know, to kind of keep up that, that pioneer image. But just another great person in the story, a bear hunter, woodsman. Um, and, I, you know, as I say, I never cease to be amazed at what comes out of the story. Even the, the state highway marker here, and I'm ashamed to, to say that I actually sat on the committee that picked these markers. I sat on that committee for three years. I kept trying to get them to change this one. It's still wrong <laughs> at Mount Mitchell. Technically speaking, he did not die in an attempt to prove this mountain the highest. He, um, he died trying to prove who's first to measure it. And um, so anyway, but be that as it may, I think what this tells us about human nature, it sort of speaks to the, to the worst of it, that there's greed, there's envy, there's craving for um, attention in human nature. Now, it, it ended tragically for both men, and I don't wanna, wanna belabor this because I wanna um, talk about some of the more recent history, but Mitchell, of course, lost his life. And, and that was tragic. Klingman didn't fare much better. I mean, he, he ended up um, in a home for the insane and was out of political office. He got sort of kicked out of political office. And he was really an odd bird. He never married, never bought land, never settled into a house. He lived in hotels and was quite a good amateur geologist in his own right. I mean, he's nationally known. But some people think that this bitter feud with Mitchell hardened over time into a kind of depression uh, for Thomas Klingman and that affected his mental health. So, um, you know, it's a, a, a really sort of tragic episode. What I like to remind people of those, they might've ended up enemies, but they actually wanted the same thing for the Black Mountains. They wanted the area to be developed. Um, they wanted North Carolina to take its place in the United States, it's a place of great natural resources. And they wanted to make money, uh, North Carolina tax dollars from that. They were both on the same, same track. And in the early 20th century, that wish came through with a vengeance. And anyone who's spent any time in the Black Mountains knows about logging. Companies from way outside the region, from as far away as Chicago, from Philadelphia, from um, and other places in Pennsylvania began to buy up the timber rights to the area, build narrow gauge railroads and began to log it with a vengeance. And always when I give this talk to people who haven't read my book, I always say, um, there's nothing wrong with this photograph. Don't adjust your set. Um, it's, a, it's very much a, a picture of the logging that took place and it's all bare land below the, the dark spruce forest. So you can see it was the worst kind of sort of cut out and get out logging. And as if that were not bad enough, hard on the heels of that came the chestnut blight, which began to take out uh, chest American chestnuts on the lower slopes of the blacks. And this is caused by a parasitic fungus that was imported from um, somewhere in Asia, we're not sure where. It turned up maybe first in the Bronx Zoo on some chestnuts there, and it turned up in North Carolina in the Piedmont first. But wherever it turned up, it started to kill American chestnuts um, by the thousands. And they were dying almost everywhere you looked. So you had this kind of double whammy thing going on, the greed of the loggers in terms of human nature and sort of humans inclination to mess with nature, to bring in trees from outside and then set off this, this plague. Uh, but just when we're about to give up on human nature, along comes John Simcox Holmes, the state's first arguably professional forester. Holmes was the devotee of uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, um, Republican conservationists. And today that sounds a little bit like a contradiction in terms. Um, Sort of, sort of like saying charismatic Presbyterian, you know, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's, a it's a bit of an oxymoron, but, but Holmes was, was dead set on doing something about Mount Mitchell, especially concerned about the logging and especially concerned about the fires that followed the logging. When an area was logged frequently, it was 
devastated by a wildfire not long after. And it was Holmes who was very instrumental in getting Mount Mitchell State Park set up. Now, Locke Craig gets the credit, and he was the politician who kind of got this thing through the legislature, but it was Holmes, and Holmes was relentless in trying to get Mount Mitchell's plight before the people. And so uh, I always like to, to give him a little credit. And it was also Holmes who started an effort to replant these peaks that had been logged to within an inch of their, their lives. And you get some idea of what they were up against here. If you look at this picture, they were out you know, replanting these uh, Fraser firs among all the stuff that had been just you know, completely taken out um, by logging. And there used to be a sign on uh, Route 128 up the mountain that commemorated this, but I haven't, uh, I think they took it down or something, I'm not sure. But if you, if you walk around Mount Mitchell now, you can still find evidence of this. They didn't just plant native trees, but they planted other trees, Norway spruce, Japanese larch, Douglas fir. And if you know what you're looking for, you can, you can find some of those uh, growing there. So again, we get that, you know, that itch to change nature, that technological fix you know, that, that humans um, love. When it came to the chestnut blight, all these trees dying on the mountains just more than these Republican conservationist, progressive foresters, pick your term. It's just more than they could stand. So began a massive salvage effort to cut dead chestnut. A lot of it went to Champion Fiber over in Canton, where they used it not only to make paper, but also to extract uh, tannin, which was used in processing leather, and there's a, a tannin vat. And one of the one of the really interesting pictures I found going into this is here's a, a three week supply of chestnut at, uh, at Champion Fiber. <laughs> and if you take a look at that, you can see that they were just sort of massively cutting these trees, dead green or you know, otherwise, uh, to, get, uh, to get them out and get them processed to make use of that timber. And it's not, you know, it's, it's, maybe not as bad as it seems in some ways. Other trees moved in, red oaks, et cetera, that replaced uh, the American chestnut in the forest canopy. So it may not be as, as bad as it seems. But in retrospect, if we look back with 2020 hindsight, some of the chestnuts that were taken off Mount Mitchell and the surrounding areas were some of the hardiest specimens in the gene pool and might have begun over time to develop some resistance to the chestnut blight. We're seeing that now uh, in, in American chestnuts. And so taking them out, turning them into telephone poles or tannin or uh, paper or whatever might have, might have been a mistake. Um, the other piece of this, the other piece of the conservation effort is tourism. And Mount Mitchell was immediately slated once it had a state park to attract tourists, new road up the mountain. Here you can see some early pictures of the road. More importantly, it was geared to attract sportsmen from outside the region. And I dug this picture out of the National Archives in Washington, DC, and I'll just tell you that it was titled Sport Fishing on the South Toe River. And you can make of that whatever you want. Um, but uh, at any rate, the, the area was sort of redefined to attract sportsmen, hunters and fishermen from outside the region. And in the process, a lot of local people got um, sort of squeezed in this. And it's another kind of negative legacy of progressive con conservation. Um, this is a place that was owned by uh, Big Tom Wilson's uh, grandson, a guy named Ewart Wilson, that used to sit right across from where the ranger station now is, um, going up to Mount Mitchell. And Ewart had this kind of cheap uh, looking uh, hotel in the eyes of the state. He kept a bunch of bear dogs around there and uh, sort of catered to any tourists who would come by and listen to him tell stories. And the state had other plans for, for Mount Mitchell and they eventually um, went to court with York and, and got his land. What the state was after was something a little more stylized, we might say. And you begin to see some of that here, this kind of rustic modern architecture and we can follow that right on through you know this is the the restaurant area 
And if we follow it through today, there's the new tower, which is very stylized and, and modern. And it sort of speaks to the idea of come enjoy nature, but enjoy it in these modern kind of surroundings, not as you or Wilson would have you enjoy it with bear dogs and stories. Um, moving toward the present, in 1955, foresters discovered that a number of Fraser firs in the region were dying. And they weren't sure why, but they eventually settled on a tiny, really primitive insect called the um, balsam woolly adelgid. And these are really, when I say primitive, I mean that they're about a 16th of an inch long. They have very primitive breeding uh, methods. They sort of reproduce asexually. The, all the aphids are actually females. But what they do is they bore into the bark of Fraser fir and eventually begin to starve the tree of nutrients and they die. And it too is an imported pest. It came from somewhere in Scandinavia. We're not sure exactly where. We're not sure exactly when, but I will remind you again of the efforts to reforest the logged over area of Mount Mitchell and bringing in exotic trees. And again, that urge, that human urge to tinker and fix. Um, as far as the state and uh, the, the Forest Service was concerned, there was a technological fix for this too. We'll just spray and we'll get rid of these, these bugs. And it works if you spray every individual tree and if you spray every tree with lindane, which is what they put in lice shampoo, by the way. It's a chlorinated hydrocarbon similar to DDT, really, in, in composition. But they sprayed it, and they sprayed it fairly uh, frequently in the park on into the, the 1970s in early 80s. If you're ever around the picnic area um, enjoying your picnic lunch, you might remember that that was a heavily sprayed area. <clears throat> But nationally, things were changing. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, came out in 1962, and it really called into question the extensive use of, of pesticides. Now, here's a great cartoon from that period that I always like to show, you know, a mantis kind of praying, God bless mama and papa, Rachel Carson. And here's something else about lindane. Eventually, the, the FDA banned lindane uh, except for its use in lice shampoo, which it held on to for a while. And so here's a little, a little cartoon illustrating that. So, you know, the, the spraying didn't really work. You can't aerial spray for the adelgid, so you really had to spray every tree. And um, nobody at the time had the money to really do that. But it didn't much matter because in the 1980s, the debate about what was killing the trees on Mount Mitchell shifted dramatically. Um, a plant pathologist at North Carolina State, a guy named Robert Bruck, began to theorize that maybe the adelgid was just a symptom. It wasn't the disease, and that the disease was air pollution, and particularly acids that accumulated in the fog on Mount Mitchell. The clouds, he argued, was, were like vacuum cleaners in the sky. They soak up all these pollutants and then kind of bathe the trees in them. So debate began to rage, is it the adelgid? Is it air pollution? Is it something else? And one newspaper said, and I, I quote this in the book, that during the 1980s, researchers were tripping all over each other on Mount Mitchell, um, trying to figure out what was going on. Why were these trees dying? And it wasn't just Mount Mitchell. I talked about uh, local to global implications. Mount Mitchell became something of a symbol for the problems of air pollution and acid deposition. And it also became a political debate at the time. Um, I got so, when I would read these studies, you know, is it the adelgid? Is it um, air pollution? Is it just the death of old trees? <clears throat> when I read these studies, when I was working on the book, I could tell where it was going before I ever read a word about who funded it. If the study was funded by the EPA, it tended to focus on air pollution. If it was funded by General Motors, which did fund research on Mount Mitchell, it tended to say, oh no, the trees are dying from the adelgid and, and um, 
and uh, and uh, old just the problems of old growth forests. Uh, pollution from automobiles has nothing to do with it. And so it became this very heated debate, and it really had more to do with what was going on in Washington, I think, than what was going on in Mount Mitchell. This is the era of Ronald Reagan and James Watt, and a lot of us in this room are old enough to remember that, but uh, Reagan was fond of sort of describing himself as a practical environmentalist, and he would go around saying things like, uh, most of this uh, air pollution comes from transpiration from trees, and so we don't need to get upset about cars or smokestacks or anything else. It's the trees giving off transpiration. This spawned a great skit on Saturday Night Live called Killer Trees. And you know they would sneak up behind people and a limb would come through them. Um, and, and you know it got Reagan mocked. I'll tell one more quick story here. He went to Claremont uh, College and there were a lot of protests uh, there against his appearance. And um, one enterprising student at Claremont hung a, a banner on one of the campus uh, trees that said, cut me down before I kill again. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and James Watt, the Secretary of the Interior, was in on this too. Watt was fond of saying that if we cut down all the trees, Jesus will return. Um, so, you know, there was a whole, a whole thing going on there, environmentalists against um, what was fast becoming the, the anti-environmental um, movement. In the end, it didn't resolve very much. Uh, the Adelgid is still present on uh, Mount Mitchell, and uh, it's still killing trees, although there is some evidence that uh, the Fraser firs are coming back. And if you've been up there, you've seen them. Uh, I haven't looked at the research, to be perfectly honest, in a long time, but I do know that the young Fraser firs are less susceptible to attack uh, by the Adelgis, and they may come back and, and thrive for a while, and then we may see an attack again. Or they may be building some natural resistance to this in spite of the, the human tinkering. Acid rain and um, air pollution, not much research that I can find going on on that now. Everything's sort of shifted in the direction of climate change, which is another problem. Mount Mitchell and that spruce fir forest, the summit is a kind of an island and it exists there only because the temperatures and the weather's markedly different from below. So if there's a slightest little shift in warming trends, that has the potential to um, affect that. So the issue has gotten even more um, complex. So I'm going to try to, uh, and you can see here, here's a slide with some of the Fraser firs um, beginning to come back. So I'm going to try to kind of wrap up the Mount Mitchell part of this and talk about um, stories and how we tell stories about Mount Mitchell. <clears throat> um, what I'm about to say is probably proof that academic people have too much time on their hands. Um, but uh, when environmental historians get together, one of the things we talk about is kind of what is the trajectory of our narrative. You can see that we have too much time on our hands. Um, or, but basically, that means what kind of story are we telling? Are we telling a story of decline? And that's been the predominant narrative in American environmental history, that America was perfect, Indians lived in harmony with nature, white people came in, and it's been a steady fall from Eden ever since. Um, that's what we call a narrative of declension or decline. Some people tell a, uh, a narrative of ascension, you know, that goes the other way, that in the case of Mount Mitchell, it was in trouble, and people like Holmes and these progressive foresters came in and saved the place by creating the state park, um, by you know, limiting hunting, making sure that game didn't get depleted, et cetera. So a couple of ways to look at this. And I don't, you know, I don't really subscribe to either one of those. I tend to think it's a very mixed story and it's mixed because of nature and, and human nature, both extremely complex, both very poorly understood, I think by, by most historians. Uh, so what I like to, to end with here is to show a couple of pictures of Mount Mitchell and then um, talk uh, about what this all means in the Civil War. Um, I got a couple of pictures here. This one was made in uh, about 1915 uh, or so, right at the heart of the logging. And it's look, you can tell it's looking out from Mount Mitchell, sort of looking north along the Black Mountain Range. 
And here's one that I took in uh, about 2001. So if I can figure out how to do this, let's, whoops, sorry. You can look at that one and you can see the logging right up to the edge of that spruce fir forest. And you look at this one. And I always like to compare this to a visit to the eye doctor. Better? Is it better one? <laughs> Is it better too? <laughs> And, and I really think it's a close call. You know, I mean, you can, you can see the destruction of the loggers, but you can also see in this picture that, that we've done some things right. You know, it's not, it's not nearly so bad, it seems to me, as it was um, at that time. I guess you could say, you know, do you see a rainbow or a, or a gathering storm coming here? Well, there are a couple people that I like who, who talk about this kind of stuff. One of them is a writer named Michael Pollan, probably best known for his book, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, which he writes about food. But he argues that what we need to do is get over the idea of Eden and wilderness and to think of places like Mount Mitchell more like a garden that we tend as human beings. And what we want there is okay. If we want it to be a place where we can picnic and camp and see red-tailed hawks and the occasional black bear, so be it, you know, but we have to always ask a question. It doesn't mean anything goes. It means how can we get what we want while nature goes about getting what she wants here. And that human history and, and natural history are almost inseparable. And then there's Carolyn Merchant. She's a really interesting uh, environmental historian. She's a, an ardent feminist, and she puts a lot of the problems on sort of the male mentality that's dominated um, forest policy and environmental policy generally. The environmental movement, when it began, was overwhelmingly white, male, middle class. Um, and so uh, Carolyn Merchant says that what we need is a, to think more about a kind of a partnership ethic with with nature. We have to listen to many voices, the voices of women, minorities, native people, and the voices of nature itself before we start um, making decisions, before we get that itch for the technological fix. And also to recognize, and this is more important than ever now, I think, that we have the power to destroy life as we know it through the use of, of pesticides and toxic chemicals and unrestrained um, development. So, um, you know, I'm grateful that Mount Mitchell is still there and that we can see it. And here's the, the now infamous publicity shot of me at uh, Mitchell Falls. <clears throat> I went there with Tom Earnhardt. We were filming a, a TV thing. And um, I hate to admit this publicly, but I think the statute of limitations has probably run out on it. Um, Earnhardt asked me if I'd ever been to Mitchell Falls before, and I said, well, no, um, which wasn't true. Uh, I had been there bushwhacked down from the top because I wanted to see it, but I didn't take any pictures or anything that time because I, you know, there were legal implications, of trespassing, et cetera. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful that it's still there and that it's, that it's still a place that we can enjoy. And, um, we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I just want to say a word because I promised my co-author I would, mainly, um, about how this led us to the to the Civil War. Our latest book is uh, my latest book is co-authored with my colleague in military history, uh, Judkin Browning at at App State, and it was really Mount Mitchell that got me thinking about the Civil War and um, environmental history. When I was doing the work on Mount Mitchell, I spent a lot of time right around here in Burnsville, and I was um, saw the monument to the Confederate dead out there, and I got to look, and I wasn't so much interested in who died as how many. And I went to counting up, you know, it was like 147 names of Confederate dead. There were also Union dead in this area, uh, and some, we don't know which side they were affiliated with. And I got to think, well, what, what was the environmental effect to that, you know, it took all these men out of the fields, you took them out of town, what did that mean? And one thing sort of led to another, and I started thinking about the Civil War in much the same way that I had thought about Mount Mitchell. And I had never been one to really want to investigate the Civil War. I was always like, eh, it's Confederate flags, mint tulips, you know, no, 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 I'm not going, I'm not going there. 
But I think if you're interested in Southern history, you end up there sooner or later, it's, it's destiny. Um, but I want to think about it in a different way. I want to think about it biologically, um, much as I had thought about Mount Mitchell. So um, I wanted to look at things like disease in, in the war, um, weather, food, animals, all the stuff that I had looked at um, in, in dealing with Mount Mitchell. Problem was, there are about 55,000 books on the Civil War, the equivalent of one per day since Lee's surrender at Appomattox with calculator. And I knew there was no way in this lifetime I was going to um, be able to familiarize myself with that literature. So I thought, you know, I'll just get a Civil War historian. And um, I talked to my colleague and we decided to do this. And so it was kind of a yin and yang thing between us. And he would do, he would do military and I would say, no, no, let's stay focused on the environment. And what we really tried to do was take a look at the Civil War as a biological environmental event. What did it mean um, to the natural world? And in terms, in, in reverse terms, what did the natural world mean uh, to the war? So that book came out in um, April of 2020. And pro tip, if you're going to write a book, try not to have it appear in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's, it's funny how these things work. And all this thought about Mount Mitchell and the technological fixes and policy and nature and human nature, um, it eventually led somewhere that, that I had no idea what, uh, when I started. And so I have become sort of by default a Civil War historian as a result of Mount Mitchell. So I thank you and I will uh, you know, entertain questions or whatever, I don't know how much time did I do on time. All right here? Yeah, good, thank you. Thank you.